Is my voice clear also, by the way, just to check. All right, wonderful. Uh, all right, so hello everyone. Welcome to Mechanical Nutrimalaru. We are thrilled to host Konstantin uh, Leonenko, hopefully I'm pronouncing it correctly, uh, for the talk with his uh, topic of making sense through making things. Uh, this will be our 105th episode of Mechanical Nutrimalaru. Uh, again, we deeply appreciate uh, accepting our invitation, uh, Mr. Konstantin. Uh, just a small introduction. Uh, Tolokar project sends a mobile maker spaces into Ukraine to support train and local communities. Uh, the word Toloka stands for tradition, uh, form of solidarity support in Ukraine. With that in mind, the Tolokar project uses mobile maker spaces equipped with tools open sources hardware, uh, machines, and consumables to support humanitarian activities in Ukraine. Various partners work together on different projects like reconstruction, renovation, open production, knowledge transfer, and innovation to strengthen the community of Ukraine. Tolokar uh, operation team leader, Mr. Konstantin uh, Leonenko, is an exper experienced leader and project manager at the uh, intersection of physical and digital with a background in startup, cultural and higher education sectors. He built and launched four digital fabrication labs, and he is a Fab Academy 2015 graduate. Uh, again, thank you very much for accepting our invitation, and uh, the stage is yours. Just a uh, little, little reminder, Constantine, hmm. they're asking if it is possible to raise the voice of your microphone. Is it possible? The groups have some difficulty, I think, to hear. Is there any possibility to, to raise the volume Let of the see. microphone? Yeah, yeah, uh, I'm trying. Uh, do, do, do. Let me. Microphone. Oh, yeah, there's the setting. Is, is this better? Yeah, much better. Thank oh, you. fantastic, fantastic. Somehow it went down in the system settings. Thank you for thank you for clarifying that. Would be would be horrible otherwise. Uh, so thank you for having me. Thank you for inviting me, Shabnam. Thank you, Halit, for, for this kind of invitation and introduction. Uh, so uh, my name is Konstantin. I am team lead for the Toloka project. And uh, Halit has already uh, explained uh, briefly what that is. Uh, and the title of my talk is Making Sense Through Making Things. Uh, and in a way, it's kind of... Uh, calls back to uh, the ideas of personal fabrication, of uh, digital fabrication, how uh, we have um, kind of arrived at this, at this place in technology development, technology evolution, where we can uh, uh, kind of reclaim this space for production, space for manufacturing, uh, in a way that we can communicate through things, and in a way kind of how stories that things carry and stories that uh, we put into things, uh, how they're becoming much more important than the actual things themselves. So uh, let me try to kind of, uh, it's, it's, I know it may sound a little bit vague uh, and I'm only trying to kind of to bring this, this whole story together, uh, uh, but I hope it kind of sets the stage for a little bit of, uh, more uh, uh, more nuanced conversation uh, later on. So uh, I don't know how many of you know uh, David Byrne uh, from Talking Heads, but he's uh, quite uh, uh, yeah. His uh, his music has made significant uh, impact on me, and one of his most iconic concerts has been uh, that that is one of my very favorite uh, concerts ever called Stop Making Sense. And uh, a long time I lived by this motto, just kind of uh, trying to not exactly not understand, but to accept the world, to kind of see what it is, kind of to, to embrace the kind of the complexity and uh, uh, as, as it is without trying to make, uh, uh, yeah, trying to make too strong of kind of judgments or kind of uh, sense understanding of what it is. But uh, since things are changing, uh, things have changed uh, quite rapidly. 
Uh, I mean, for me, this uh, personally, for me, this war started in 2013. Uh, for many people in Ukraine, uh, it started in 2022. Uh, many people in the world still don't quite feel, comprehend, understand what this means now, uh, what this means for the future. But uh, uh, it is war outside, uh, and we need to uh, come to terms with it and understand how to orient ourselves and whether we can live by the stop making sense motto. So pacifism is a privilege. Uh, this is uh, this was one popular Instagram post to uh, to try to communicate this position that uh, nobody, no, none of my friends in Ukraine ever chose to pick up guns or weapons. Uh, none of them ever wanted, none of them had any kind of militant background, none of them were interested in weapons or war, any any sort of that uh, activity. But there's that expression, you may not be interested in war and politics, but they're interested in you. So here's a slight edit of this uh, of this post uh, by a good friend a colleague, and colleague of mine, uh, pacifism was my privilege. Uh, there's uh, in a situation like this, it's it's impossible to to stand by and campaign just kind of peace for the peace sake. And a lot of people are very uncomfortable with the ideas of kind of uh, supplying weapons, making weapons, kind of embracing the the violence that is necessary to defend oneself. These are all very uncomfortable things. They're all very painful questions, uh, but essential ones. So going a little bit back, in 2012, I set up the first Fab Lab in Ukraine uh, called Izalab. It's in my hometown in Donetsk. Uh, it was a beautiful place. Uh, we ran a lot of workshops, had wonderful vibe, wonderful atmosphere. Uh, we're kind of all running workshops. Uh, before we, even we got our first 3D printer, we started doing this spaghetti architecture workshop that... Uh, uh, I once discovered is kind of uh, a professional sport for uh, engineering students, as it's a fantastic tool to learn how, say, intuitively understand how uh, metal structures work, how how you build bridges and towers and all of that. And it may seem super silly, but it's actually it's a very fundamental experience uh, for people to learn about these things. At the same time, it's very creative, very helpful. Well, actually, they were so popular, uh, we, <laughs> we almost had to kind of to, uh, even after we got our laser cutters and 3D printers, people were still demanding uh, spaghetti building workshops uh, because they uh, they bring such intuitive knowledge and such a great experience uh, in learning about kind of technology and uh, engineering and structures. At the same time, some people turn it into purely creative kind of sculptural endeavor. And among our visitors, there was this gentleman, not so gentle of a man, uh, Roman Lagin. He was bringing his kids and his family to participate in our events. Uh, and kind of, because Isolab, our lab, was part of a big uh, cultural foundation called Isolatia. Uh, we had big kind of old factory territory that we were converting into kind of creative village. And uh, our fab lab, Isolab, was kind of, uh, the core, uh, the one of the core elements in it to enable this uh, this transformation. And in 2014, uh, Roman led uh, the referendum, the so-called referendum that uh, uh, in Russia's. Uh, uh, toolkits, it's one of the ways to annex territories and to legitimize their violence. And Roman was the person who uh, uh, who kind of, uh, well, carried it out. So that's that's him holding sort of the, the results. And uh, shortly thereafter, he came to the to Zelatsi again, but this time he brought his friends uh, and his friends brought tanks uh, and they brought more military equipment uh, and more, and they turned Izolatia into a military base, uh, into a prison, uh, 
into torture chambers. Uh, so some of our exhibition spaces from uh, yeah hosting uh, works from our uh, art residents they were turned into torture chambers, and torture chambers can look much simpler than anyone anyone would imagine. Uh, so that's just uh, 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 a field uh, telephone lying there. It's just a thing that generates high voltage with the crank of a hand. Uh, some tape and water, uh, and uh, people get very creative at, uh, 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 yeah, uh, inflicting pain. So one of the people who, who went through that through that hell is uh, Vladislav uh, Stanislav Vasilyev. So he wrote a book uh, about his experience about uh, going through this. Uh, uh, there has been recently a uh, feature film done, uh, made that uh, kind of with his with his memories. Uh, very painful one, but very useful to watch and to to comprehend uh, what is uh, what some people in this in this world have to have to go through. So when I was telling kind of. My story, uh, the story of the labs that I was building, it somehow started falling into place that the postal addresses uh, and other kind of landmarks associated with the labs fell into a strange kind of uncanny pattern that uh, our first lab, uh, Isolab, uh, was located on the street that is called the Path of Light. And uh, it was one a uh, beautiful two-floor building that we were renovating and pouring reinforced concrete, uh, uh, planning to put kind of green roof on top. Uh, it was a beautiful uh, architectural renovation project, but that never happened. Uh, then in uh, 2018 to 2020, I worked with the Swiss NGO Terdezom. Uh, we were setting up more labs across the, the contact line of then and next territories uh, between Severodonetsk and Mariupol. Uh, we established this time not a single big lab, but we established a, a whole network of labs. So we made two bigger labs in Mariupol and Severodonetsk and a bunch of smaller ones uh, around them. And we had the, the kind of the training, they all get together for all lab managers in Severodonetsk in the hotel called Peace. And then that hotel was one of the first uh, points through which Russian uh, soldiers defying Donetsk uh, were coming in. So this is this is exactly the the room in in which I was conducting my workshops. Uh, uh, teaching people how to 3D print little little objects, how to uh, kind of getting them the basics, the foundations of uh, of digital fabrication. Uh, so that was the hotel called Peace. Uh, and then in 2022, uh, uh, I have joined Project Toloka, which is now we have three mobile makerspaces uh, traveling. Uh, they're based kind of across all of Ukraine and East and North uh north center and northeast uh and uh, when we arrived with toller cars into ivan frankivsk uh, driving them from hamburg our first parking spot uh was the street of stepana bandera and stepan bandera is uh, the iconic ukrainian resistance fighter very controversial figure for his uh uh, uh anti anti-Jewish, uh, well, Jewish massacres uh, that, that took place in, in those horrible times. But uh, nevertheless, kind of this controversial figure is probably one of the biggest uh, fighters for Ukrainian freedom. So uh, going from path of light, looking forward for something bright future, building one big lab and investing kind of all our resource into one location, and that that being destroyed, uh, then going to the network of labs, kind of already kind of on the along the occupied territories, and trying to get some sort of peace situation, and still being hopeful for peace to emerge out of that. 
uh, but already kind of distributing ourselves and investing into into larger network and community uh, to and ultimately losing that as well to going to kind of okay we didn't get to settle ourselves in any sports we have three mobile labs now uh, they distribute all over Ukraine and uh, the kind of the the world brings that uh, well it's it starts with the name of uh, Stepana Bandera in a way. Uh, so uh, around that time, my Facebook feed and feeds of uh, well, this is a screenshot from the Ukrainian 3D printing group. Uh, it was turning from you kind know, of making toys uh, to making other kind of toys, as one of the commenters posted. Uh, that's presence, and that's presence as kind of uh, Ukrainian dark humor can uh, uh, can afford it. Uh, and uh, this is the reality uh, of what it is, uh, what these technologies mean right now in Ukraine for, uh, for the country. Uh, going into a little bit broader into why things uh, are so important, uh, making sense through making things. Uh, here is an exhibition in that was held in 2014, and it was actually toured across, uh, across several cities in Europe and the US. It's called Material Evidence, and we all used to kind of, uh, to the fact that things are the ultimate evidence of any act and kind of even, uh, I mean, that's it's kind of the most core, core ways, most reliable ways we can communicate any sort of what we want to call truth. Uh, and uh, Russia knows that all too well how important it is. Uh, so they set up uh, this exhibition uh, and uh, plugged it into some of the most iconic central uh, kind of left alternative uh, progressive uh, uh, platforms around the world. Uh, I don't know how many of you know about iBeam. Uh, it is one of the key oldest New York most uh, influential galleries uh, and uh, in new media that uh, holds a lot of residencies. It's a historically very important place uh, for that. And, uh, uh, and then suddenly there's uh, an exhibition that is financed. There's this beautiful Wikipedia article on that. Uh, I highly recommend you go and read it. Uh, but to understand how uh, Russian propaganda can work in a ways uh, and how it can penetrate kind of the the groups and opinions uh, where you would expect it least. Uh, and uh, yeah, that exhibition basically the point was that they fuse together all of the conflicts in the world that are happening and blame it all the, on the US. Uh, and that, that resonates really well with the kind of audience of this uh, of these places that they think, yes, indeed, uh, kind of US is such a horrible imperialist state that we need to resist this. And then suddenly, kind of, uh, it's not about what the horrors that Russia is doing in, in Syria and Ukraine. It is about, uh, it is about kind of US Imperialism, and that's Russia used this uses it very, very skillfully. So it's important to be aware of these things. A uh, couple more things. This is uh, uh, what is what has become the Fab Academy in Russia. Uh, that's a hundred sixty students in uh, Fab Lab Polytech uh, in Saint Petersburg, uh, recruited seventh of March, twenty twenty two. Uh, so Russia had a huge, oh, MIT had a huge uh, uh, program with Russian government, uh, with a lot of Russian institutions investing in kind of, uh, well, launching a whole network of fab labs, investing into fab academy. Uh, and uh, then Russia announces that they have their first naval drones developed at fab lab Polytech or developed at Polytech. Uh, so how much of that expertise that U.S. has shared in this, uh, MIT has shared and invested in uh, uh, in this kind of act of faith that we should be spreading the knowledge and sharing the knowledge. And in this way, we can achieve uh, uh, kind of peaceful coexistence and collaboration. We can see that it doesn't always work. 
granted MIT literally the next day after the start of the invasion, they pulled out uh, of all of these programs almost immediately, uh, which is huge kudos to them because uh, it, that was not the case in 2014. Uh, let's put it like this. So that's kind of a larger uh, question about things and making sense of things. Now let's talk a bit more about Toloka specifically. Uh, so this is a map of our interventions across Ukraine for the last, what is it, uh, 14, 15 months. Uh, you can see that uh, we have uh, kind of our main, uh, our three Tolokas are, oh, I'm sorry, uh, our three Tolokas are distributed. One is in Kiev, uh, one is all the way to the left in Ivanofran Kivsk, and one is to the right in Okhtyrka. Uh, you can see they kind of, uh, a big number of interventions clustered there. Uh, we often uh, try to make events where we bring several cars together, uh, kind of trying to identify some bigger uh, bigger projects, uh, <clears throat> which would also facilit facilitate kind of knowledge exchange between our, uh, between our teams, our operators. Um, let me now actually stop sharing this, and I will share with you our live uh, database of... Uh, uh where we document all our work and uh it will be i will go through that in that way so share screen and now i will share this yes so this is kind of our internal database that we use to uh to manage all our projects through uh and there's a particular kind of subset uh, of all of the work that we do uh, that we share with some of our partners uh, to see what what has been done in sort of almost nearly real time. Our Instagram feed is probably the most active ways of communicating externally our work, but uh, for those kind of slightly closer, uh, they have access to uh, uh, to this thing. And uh, let me just kind of start from the beginning. Uh, and uh, so somewhere from October uh, last year. So when we get the Tolokas in, and Toloka is a very is a very experimental project. It's the first time in the world it happens like that, that uh, such such an investment is made into such kind of uncharted territory. Everybody, a lot of people kind of assume that uh, having mobile maker spaces in the area of crisis should enable people to come up with their solutions. Uh, but it is quite a far reaching assumption uh, to, to do that. And it's quite a risky thing to, uh, to implement it at the, at the scale that the Toloka is running. So building uh, what five of these, five of these uh, vehicles, we're currently operating three. One has left the country. One is uh, still kind of in the process of uh, being re, uh, uh, reorganized uh, administratively. Uh, but we started, I mean, I joined the project in uh, September, while the first Tolokas were already here in Ukraine in, uh, I think, in, in May. Uh, and uh, that part of the work is not, is not even here. Uh, but they, those first vehicles that were here, uh, they were doing things like building houses, rebuilding houses. They built mobile intensive care unit. They turned a big bus uh, into an intensive care unit that can carry simultaneously five, uh, uh, basically an ambulance for five people. Uh, and... Uh, but kind of trying to understand is this the most impactful way of using these uh, vehicles? Is this kind of is there uh, is this the best and the most uh, uh, because for example, with reconstruction, there's well in Ukraine right now there's infinite amount of reconstruction to be done. Uh, but is investing into kind of mobile workshops uh, uh, is it the most effective way uh, to to kind of do you really need 3D printers or laser cutters or any of that stuff to rebuild houses, you don't really. There's much more effective ways of using that. 
uh, of using that resource. So we, in a way, Toloka is very much about, we spent this last year sort of trying as many different ways, as many different interventions, formats, partners, uh, locations, trying to understand and seek what, uh, what works the best. And uh, in the beginning, we started doing a lot of workshops with kind of introductory 3D printing. Uh, and we're uh, partnering with Tepdezom, uh, the same way that uh, the same organization that we were setting up labs in eastern Ukraine. They were supporting a number of refugee centers in western Ukraine. Uh, we visited those spaces and we're giving this kind of uh, basic keychain 3D printing. And in this way, we try to understand kind of who are these people, who is there, uh, what kind of conditions they're living in, what can they, uh, what can they benefit from. Uh, and uh, by doing it through, not just kind of through interviews, through calls, through conversations, but exactly through making things. You know, we come on site, everybody, the magic thing about 3D printers is that everybody wants a workshop in 3D printing. So kind of people, everybody is very happy to welcome you, uh, uh, to kind of to facilitate that, especially if you, if that doesn't cost them anything, kind of to look how, uh, has the budget for all of these interventions. So we spent probably a couple of months traveling around and doing a lot of these workshops. Uh, in some places, our team was uh, doing smaller things like helping people replace uh, batteries in their uh, headlamps and meanwhile kind of teaching them soldering. So somewhere people were giving kind of sticker and plot workshops. So sort of really basic things, but already through doing these things, through running these workshops, we started getting a feel for for the needs uh, for people who are out there, their kind of situations. Uh, and gradually, uh, kind of we're getting to a little bit more complex, ambitious things like, well, uh, we have one very experienced carpenter on the team, uh, furniture maker, so he... Uh, Sorry for the upside down pictures. A table sometimes does that. Uh, he together with the together with the girl uh, that is an internally displaced person, uh, they built for her a set of furniture for her bedroom. Uh, then uh, we've been doing more kids workshops in robotics, experimenting with those kind of things. Uh, and uh, gradually we're kind of. Uh, uh, exploring a little bit more complex interactions and then we uh, get in touch with uh, with the school in Truskavets uh, and I was uh, there is uh, Denis Shilenko uh, our now very very dear colleague uh, uh, he told us that there is this school uh, elementary school in Truskavets but because it is located Truskavets is a kind of resort, it's like a spa town in western Ukraine. It's close to Carpathian Mountains. Uh, it has a lot of mineral water sources, uh, and a lot of people go there for rehabilitation. Uh, and a lot of veterans, a lot of amputees uh, go there, kind of waiting for their diagnosis, waiting for their treatments. Uh, and that school uh, is located right next to this hospital, and there's a local NGO that works uh, with the veterans uh, and looks for ways to kind of uh, to support them while on their journey uh, because people in that in that condition it's emotionally very very difficult time for them uh, uh, so there's a school that was looking for a long time to set up a lab uh, a lab like this a small fab lab they applied for different funding before the war before the COVID all of that didn't happen uh, due to that, but then we came there for a visit again, printing a lot of keychains and teaching kids uh, just kind of the basics of 3D printing, but we decided to extend it a little bit more uh, and uh, spend a couple of days and invite veterans to uh, spend some time with the kids and just kind of see what happens and maybe they would uh, they would learn some little skills, uh, maybe for them it would be an interesting way to just kind of step out of the hospital or kind of out of the usual uh, circle. Uh, and the kids, after spending one day in Tinkercad, uh, they, uh, we suggested kind of that they, they talk to the veterans and uh, they, we tried to kind of gently nudge them to some sort of design thinking processes. 
so that they would try to to talk to the to the veterans and understand what what are their needs and then maybe try to use their newly gained skills to solve to provide some sort of solutions for for the veterans and at the end of these three days uh, here's this uh, gentleman uh, Sergei uh, I think his name is uh, uh, he's missing a part of his uh, part of his foot so uh, that's why he he has to uh, have walking aid all the time which makes it difficult for him to kind of to to pick a phone uh, from a pocket or to zip it but he he said that he would really want a phone holder on his belt that would that the phone would slide in under a particular angle that would make it very comfortable for him and that's what the kids did uh 10 year old kids who spent one day uh i mean not not one day one hour workshop they were given in tinkercad and the rest of the time they spent just kind of fooling around themselves we we don't really do any teaching and this, this is one thing we always try to, to steer away from we we try to set up situations, environments where people do their own learning. Uh, we support them along the way as much as possible, but we try to minimize our teaching uh, uh, so as to give people maximum possibility to 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 learn for themselves. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was a really spectacular outcome when. Uh, after this kind of minimum intervention, uh, we got as far as a sort of as a prototype of that uh, uh, of that phone holder uh, designed by nine year olds and not just randomly designed, but with the requirements, with the kind of request from this uh, veteran MQT. Here's another workshop uh, that we, that we held in Brody. Uh, that's a small town again in Western Ukraine. Uh, the spectacular thing about this workshop is that we run it in during complete blackouts. Uh, we have uh, big batteries in Toloka that we're able to power the whole computer classroom from and the 3D printers. So even Russian rockets didn't stop our 3D printing workshops. So there's a bunch of, uh, a lot of interventions uh, like that. Uh, uh, then... Uh, uh, when an opportunity arose that we actually had a budget to install some and donate some 3D printers to organizations, we already had a very good idea who would make best use of these machines. So because we already worked with these people, we knew their motivation, we knew their kind of conditions, circumstances. Uh, and so then GAZ, our donor at a certain point, uh, they said, well, here's 20 3D printers, please kind of uh, put them where where they would work best and uh, so then we after that kind of we ran our second iteration of these workshops uh, uh, with organizations but not just teaching them printing we already taught them how to build assemble calibrate a 3d printer for their own so that they can start growing their labs and that, that is one of the key things that we try to do all the time is that we do as iterative work as possible and it's about kind of setting up conversation uh, with every such recipient, and I will almost always like a business card visit is this 3D printed keychain. And we do a lot of these workshops, and some people like, well, how many of these 3D printing keychain workshops you can do? And I say just as many as necessary, uh, because this is just our hello <laughs> uh, statement. But any conversation starts from a hello. Uh, some of them go further, some of them don't go further, but every conversation has to start with a hello. So that's that's what we do. Uh, that's what we do a lot. Uh, and there's also quite a challenging thing in that sense uh, to explain and to motivate the team of our operators. Uh, kind of when we have these long driving hours uh, across Ukraine, uh, and there's often this this question is uh, kind of well, uh, people, friends. Uh, uh, in our environments, they they go to war. Uh, there's regular news of somebody uh, perishing uh, at the front line, and then there's us driving around, kind of doing 3D printing keychains, and it's continuous question like, why are we doing this? How relevant is this? Why is this necessary? Uh, but every time I try to communicate as much as I can, that uh, uh, to make to be able to make best use of these tools and this technology, 
we need a wide society literacy around these things. We need to be able to communicate in these things and in these tools and these technologies. And unless we do that, uh, we, no matter how many 3D printers you throw at all of these communities, if people don't know uh, how to talk about them, what to do with them, uh, this will not, this will have zero results. So I see it as our very important work to, yeah. uh, to these communities where people can talk uh, in these things in a way. Yeah, was somebody uh, saying something? Uh, no, okay. If, if somebody has questions, comments, remarks, please feel free to interrupt me any moment. I'm happy because I can uh, I can talk about this for four for hours uh, without stopping. Uh, uh, then <clears throat> the, other, uh, the other intervention that we did, the other solution is that uh, there's uh, a brilliant uh, Cambridge inventor, uh, Harry Blackiston Houston, and he came up with this spectacular, super simple design for temporary windows insulation. It's a very cheap, very effective solution where you just make a PVC uh, tube frame, you wrap it in plastic foil once, and then you put insulation noodles around it and you wrap it in plastic foil again. And this way you get uh, three uh, airtight chambers uh, of air uh, that you can fit into any window and you can manufacture a window, fabricate a window like this in half an hour on any custom dimension virtually of any shape, or some th shapes of course are a little bit more complicated, but it's very doable. It costs about 10 euro per square meter. Uh, and uh, it is a brilliant solution. He with his uh, he set up an NGO and uh, with a group of volunteers uh, in Eastern Ukraine, they have set up hundreds and hundreds of windows like this. And we thought this is an amazing thing that uh, we should be doing as well, and uh, we should try. But through a number of circumstances, we only managed to uh, uh, to get to this project in February 2022. And we arrived in Ventochtirka in uh, Eastern Ukraine, where there was, we had a list from the local city council of something like 180 houses that need windows. Uh, but then once we started visiting those places, some people were so skeptical of plastic film, they didn't, for them, they didn't want to see any plastic film at all. And they didn't, even though they were in the colds, they didn't understand the, the value of of such a design versus kind of standard sheet, one single sheet of uh, of plastic film. Some people were afraid that uh, some people just wanted real glass windows and they were afraid that if they will receive this kind of temporary windows that they will never receive their glass windows. Uh, so our main insight through, through this project, uh, project, we didn't get to install as many windows as we wanted, but one of the key lessons for us was here that even the most beautiful, elegant technical solution uh, from a solution from a technical perspective uh, has a huge sort of emotional and social dimension, which you need to take into account when trying to implement it. Uh, and uh, so far we don't have kind of an easy answer to that, but at least we kind of identified that, uh, uh, yeah, in this case, most of our work actually went into finding the right the right person, the right household where this solution would be appropriate. Those that we managed to find, uh, it made a huge difference. But rather than installing, I don't know, 150 windows, we only installed 50. Uh, so, uh, but nevertheless, it was an extremely valuable experience. Uh, and uh, actually, he is uh, one of the best things that happened. So we ran several workshops for local communal services. Uh, people who respond first to the uh, to kind of to any broken windows situation, uh, and uh, so this was in February twenty three, uh, and in June twenty three, it's not in these photos. Uh, is that that ah this actually this was the team Velika Pisarevka. Uh, we did it there, and then after that, we donated a whole bunch of these materials that we didn't get to use. Uh, we left it there with the local communal services team. And uh, in June, suddenly I get a message uh, from uh, Sergei, uh, one of our partners there, and uh, there was some new shelling. 
because they're right on the border. This is like five kilometers from uh, from the Russian border. Uh, and in June, there were sort of incursions uh, by... Uh, there was this kind of Ukrainian specially designed operation where they gathered a group of Russian citizens into a separate unit and they went into Russia attacking them. And that was happening exactly in that region, uh, in that neighborhood. So Russia was uh, attacking back and uh, there were again dozens of windows broken all around. Luckily, there were no casualties, but tons of windows. And they sent me photos that same morning that had virtually all of those windows replaced uh, using this material. So that's that that was to me the biggest uh, indicator that it's, it, it works exactly as it should when the solution is so simple, uh, but it needs to reach the right people and there would be a right situation, right moment when it's used and then it's then it's the best thing. Uh, but that's that's kind of how all of these things need to come together. So it's much more about uh, not just developing technical solution, but sort of telling a story with this and making that's making sure that that story uh, is remembered by those people, and that's uh, then the solution can be can be effective. And so a little bit later, uh, Truskavets, that uh, place where we first visited and had that workshop with veterans, uh, we discussed with them that they already wanted, uh, as I said before, they had done several attempts at securing funding for their uh, for their lab but it never worked but they were so kind of ready uh, for that uh, that uh, we discussed and we found a place uh, they they located uh, a very central room in their school kind of on the ground floor right next to the canteen with a big kind of social kids area so flagship sports in this uh, in this location uh, and all we did there was install some shelves. They they did the painting themselves. We installed some, some shelves and a couple of 3D printers and a, a small little laser cutter. Uh, but we did as much communicating and as much training, explaining to them how this lab should function, that it should be an open space, that kids should have free access to it, that it should not be sort of part of any standard school curriculum. It should be kind of almost as a parallel entity at school it should be an open workshop uh not just not just another classroom uh and uh, right now this place is absolutely bursting with uh, with activities uh, and uh, uh local uh, actually this this morning and there was uh uh un development uh, uh unhcr development organization there uh looking at this lab and there's now a conversation about setting up a much bigger uh, uh turning a much bigger building in Truskavets into into kind of center with a into a big hub like this and exactly kind of meeting all of these uh, needs and goals because once you start with something so small and simple but and there's a big community around this and it's so easy then to see how uh how it impacts this community uh, because a lot of people have heard about the labs but not many people have seen what it means uh to run it and what effect it has on people it's a totally different conversation when you when a toloka is there and when people see this van and then suddenly things kind of click in their head this is how it can work when people start doing their first 3d prints it suddenly kind of lands uh, in their minds that is how it works and then that click in their heads happens not in one person, not in two people, but in communities. And that's when uh, uh, it's already much easier to kind of to progress further uh, because kind of this communication, this story grows by itself. Uh, and uh, I'll maybe probably will come back. Yeah, there's, uh, there are more pictures from, uh, from Truskavets. Oops. Uh, so, so what else? Uh, yeah, ah, Chernihiv. Let's get to Chernihiv now. Another uh, beautiful story uh, is that Chernihiv is a very old town uh, in northeastern uh, Ukraine, and uh, uh, we get in touch there with a couple NGOs that work together. One of them is uh, kind of 
championing transforming Chernihiv into a cycling city, uh, working lobbying in the city council for more cycling infrastructure for bicycle parking. They have uh, they have a kind of community workshop where they receive a lot of donated bicycles from Europe. Uh, then you renovate them and distribute them. And there's another NGO that uh, renovates. Uh, so Chernihiv has very particular wooden lace uh, architecture. Uh, there are a lot of these uh, very old houses with beautiful but very derelict uh, w elaborate woodwork, uh, decorative woodwork around them. Uh, and there's a small group of volunteers that care about this heritage and they went uh, kind of, uh, they gathered together on the weekends uh, completely for free, putting their own money, their own effort, doing that. But making this intricate woodwork for them was always a challenge. Uh, they, they only had access to one small CNC mill in the university. They could only produce so much, uh, and that's that was exactly what Toloka could do uh, easily. So we have this uh, beautiful portable uh, full sheet CNC machine. Uh, our batteries we just installed this this thing there, uh, and we chopped enough of these things uh, to uh, to kind of to secure a couple months of work uh, for this NGO to to go further. We helped them uh, kind of treat them, install them. Um, uh, and in a couple months, that's that particular building was completely done. And at the same time, when a thing like this happens, then uh, it again it sort of brings much more attention from the local TV, from the local communities. Uh, we uh, eventually helped them. We used those same digital files uh, from that wooden lace. I'm not sure if it would be somewhere here. But we use them to to cut little kind of keychains uh, uh, again, <laughs> keychains uh, and some little souvenirs that uh, they use to sell and fundraise for their future work. So suddenly, there's the digital fabrication element that not only makes things work but tells the story and spreads the story much further, uh, helping this uh, these communities. Uh, so here's. So we built uh, kind of another uh, uh, this sort of public space in front of this bicycle workshop uh, that has again uh, sort of led to that becoming kind of a community space and a place where people just want to come and hang out and they uh, a little bit later they turn it into a bicycle kitchen, cycling kitchen they start selling coffee out of that window uh, and then Sort of, we identify now having that experience with Truskaves and with Chernihiv, we have identified this kind of pattern that when we see that there is a local group of activists, but not just kind of one organization, ideally it would be kind of three different groups. Uh, and very often the pattern is some sort of educational establishment, some sort of NGO, some sort of uh, administration. And when you see that they're working together, that's a really great sign that they're already, they're very ready to kind of, to receive a small kind of nudge, a small push to help them build something, help them figure out a couple little things into how these tools can uh, can support them. Uh, and uh, then it just kind of explodes and evolves completely on their own, uh, on their own path. So it's kind of, it's really communities at that pivotal point where uh, we literally had when we're in Chernihiv, we went to see that meets the Polytechnic uh, uh, University, the, the head of the university. And again, he had that sort of, yeah, we've been thinking about this sort of lab for a long time, but we don't really know what it is, how it could be. Uh, yeah, he's more of uh, Truskavis. And then I'm like, wait, wait a second. So here's a picture of Fab Lab Iceland. And on this one picture, you can see all of these machines, all of these processes, all of these people doing the same thing. It's like, Oh, now I get it. Uh, and then we go down, and here's kind of uh, here's the toll car, and that's all of these machines packed into into a van like this, and it doesn't need to cost you a million, and you can start with a little thing. Uh, and literally uh, within a couple of weeks, actually that that same day we went uh, to see the location, uh, and there was uh, a big old uh, cinema building as part of the university. Uh, owned by the university, but they didn't really know what to do with this. And like, well, now we know. Here's the place. 
uh, and we will build a business incubator in there. And this kind of lab will be uh, a key core thing there. And that's exactly what happened. By the way, yeah, this uh, this is the renovated house in Chernihiv. That's already our second uh, visit afterwards. That's already the launch of that house with a whole group of volunteers. These are the key chains that we cut for them. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> then, then we come to Chernihiv the second time. And the second time already, we launch uh, uh, an epic full uh, full scale lab like this. Where is that? Uh, where is that report? That's the bicycle kitchen. Uh, also, quite tellingly, uh, that cinema is called Peremoha, which in Ukrainian means victory. Um, so, uh, yes, there it is. So that's that's already the the public launch of that uh, of that new space. Uh, and we brought all three telecasts there. We worked there for for two weeks. It was uh, a big big event. Uh, and now, again, once that, once there is, they have this kind of initial small little nudge, and people see what that means. Uh, <clears throat> uh, then, kind of funding is not as much of a problem anymore because there's a number of donors operating in Ukraine now who look for initiative to support, but uh, they need to see people who actually who have some sort of uh, tangible results. Uh, and right now there's uh, this kind of uh, beautiful, I, I don't want to share the details, but there's huge, very, very promising uh, developments around uh, that place happening right now. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of very briefly, I think I should uh, wrap up now. This is our Kiev team uh, renovating bomb shelters and uh, building furniture there. Uh, our Tirka team has done uh, similar work, but from uh, uh, from reused pallets. Uh, uh, yeah, and that's kind of the beautiful thing about working with hands and and working with these machines is. Uh, it attracts so many people who want to contribute, who want to work. It's so engaging uh, for this kind of community work. And uh, yeah, uh, the kind of our main challenge is to finding and uh, identifying and formulating these engagement formats that uh, uh, that kind of multiply this this effect as uh, as much as possible. Uh, yeah. I think I'm done. Does that tell you enough? Again, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Konstantin. It was a very uh, informative uh, presentation, to be honest. Um, now I think we're going to jump into the Q&A section. So if anyone has a question, either uh, unmute yourself or you can write it in the chat. Where do I find the chat? Chat. Not much in the chat. No questions. <laughs> I told everything. I'm, I, I, I'm waiting for the students in fact to ask me. I'm sure there are some questions. And I would like to introduce you to Banu Vanaja. She's the director of the graduate program. Yeah. I think we met before. Uh, we have yeah, 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 we met. Uh -huh. Thank you, Constantin. Thank you very much. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting. Well, then, if no one's going to ask something, then I might start. <laughs> okay. Um uh, so uh, I want to connect this concept of solo cars uh, with the project that we are ongoing uh, in our uh, master program uh, mm -hmm. at our university. Uh, and uh, mainly we are working in this, um, you know, earthquake areas that happened in uh, Turkey, which is Hatay or the southern region uh, of Turkey. And right now, um, we are trying to, you know, introduce this concept of uh, repair, uh, do it yourself, 
uh, kind of a fabrication laboratory um, into the, uh, you know, uh, the culture of uh, Hatay, which is kind of needed because uh, in the, let's say, in the, I don't want to call it a village because uh, we, we are working in a, a place where it's neither a, a city nor a village at the same time. Uh, mm -hmm. But they do need such an, uh, uh, you know, knowledge uh, in their uh, culture, let's say. So I think uh, one of the things that I really liked about uh, the initiative of Tolokar is you, you're kind of creating a proof of concept. And that's what makes people hooked up into this concept, I think. Uh, because as far as I understand, uh, once you keep, you know, explaining it to them, showing them some, uh, you know, uh, even little as, uh, you know, a key chain, that is enough for them to, you know, uh, you know, think, or maybe we can do something out of this. Maybe we can improve it. We can uh, work upon it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but uh, you know, my main concern is uh, right now. I believe uh, we don't have such a, let's say, knowledge on how uh, to introduce it for the locals. Um, how do you think we should do that? I mean. I know that you started with schools, let's say, for example. Um, is there any other ways, maybe, perhaps? I mean, the key question is, uh, what is what is exactly the goal? Because if the goal is to uh, give, some, give people some uh, immediate uh, help and immediate relief, then 3D printers are not exactly the best the best tool for them digital fabrication is quite a complex thing uh it requires a uh, complex setup it requires quite some involvement it requires some time before people learn enough about it to be able to make uh, use of it uh which is uh, uh which is what it is it's just uh, it is great at building communities it is great at engaging kids uh and uh, but at the same time, uh, kind of even providing sort of a form of childcare uh, in communities and freeing parents from child duties uh, and parents not being worried about kids' education uh, lets parents engage in stuff to rebuild their communities. So, in the, uh, it's kind of how you bring it, how communicate it, because very often. Uh, people who are sort of new to this area, uh, they try to communicate it or kind of have expectations about it as well. 3D printing will kind of make anything and solve anything. Of course it won't. Uh, but once you know yourself, kind of you have the experience of these tools, technologies, uh, once you find the right sort of scenarios, the right entry points for it, uh, it can work wonders. Uh, at the same time, uh, it is uh, what, uh, what kind of, the path that that we choose is to, to exactly to engage in this kind of very step by step conversation. Uh, so and because sometimes you come to the community. I mean, uh, I was last summer I was volunteering at uh, at a dog uh, at a dog shelter, uh, uh, and uh, every weekend there comes a group of volunteers, uh, and at some point there was lack of food, but now there's kind of mountains of food. Uh, uh in that sense uh, uh but uh, we came there uh and somebody had to volunteer for the shit team to go and clean the cages from the shit and it's like well uh i'll be there and we got a group of people uh on the shit team and uh there were no shovels uh and we couldn't finish we couldn't do that job just because there were no shovels uh and i'm like well yeah so if we would have come to this dog shelter with the taller guy and the 3D printers and trying to tell them that we can help you somehow, why do you bring 3D printers when they need shovels? Uh, so that is that is kind of the most important thing to understand the role of such tools and such technologies because some of them are just conversation starters. And 3D printers are great conversation starters, but it's important to kind of to direct the conversation in a way to kind of to yield uh, some answers and some sort of starting points for, okay, uh, here we made this little 3D printing workshop for you. The whole community showed up uh, because they're all interested. They all have kind of expectations about it, uh, but maybe they 
come away disappointed that 3D printers will not fix their houses, not at, at least not right now. But in a way, you manage to kind of to get their attention and to understand, well, actually, guys, what do you need? Maybe you need uh, sledgehammers. Maybe you need, I don't know, windows. Maybe you need something else. Uh, so that's that's how I see it, is that kind of uh, this technology. And ultimately, yes, every community will benefit from an open workshop. Every community will benefit from a fab lab. But uh, kind of not, it has to be there, not kind of as a spaceship landed, uh, kind of completely insulated and isolated. They need to grow into that. They need to grow the understanding that's what they needed for, how they would use it. So, and this this is how what I think is important. And uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe just a few uh, comments I would like to add. Actually, uh, now I'm thinking about it really makes sense. The title that you mentioned uh, makes sense through making things. Uh, at least, I think in Arabic we have, uh, I don't know if it exists in English as well. We have this uh, thing, uh, the need is the mother of all creation. Uh, so, I mean, that's how we usually also, you know, innovate uh, stuff. Uh, the spoon or the fork came from the need of, you know, having tools to eat with, right? Um, the, the second one is, um, at least through our experience, because we've went, we've went, uh, to these, um, areas of disaster that happened. It was quite recent, like, uh, two weeks ago. Uh, and mm -hmm. through our uh, visit, we, we realized that some people already try to uh, do things by themselves or initiate some stuff by themselves. Uh, but they do lack, let's say the expertise or the know-how, uh, knowledge of doing such things. I mean. Um, as an example, I would give you, um, we were, uh, you know, traveling at, at a very late hour and uh, we wanted to eat something. And, uh, there was this, uh, let's say a uh, meat shop, uh, which is, let's say constructed on the side of the road. Right. And it was basically made out of few sticks of wood with some, uh, tent like, uh, fabric and a small kitchen on the outside. And the guy was already working, you know, like, uh, he didn't let this. Uh, earthquake disaster thing stop him from doing something and what yeah. struck my mind is that you know the people already have this you know like urge to do something and to move on to you know uh you know go on with their life with their activity because apparently some people don't want to sit at home and you know wait for uh help to you know reach them so mm -hmm. i thought maybe why not we you know uh, we boost that and lead them in a in a, in a more let's say organized more uh structured manner yeah. So yeah, thank you very much. It's uh, uh, that that's also kind of a very hard choice every time, uh, kind of because you cannot help everyone. Uh, you cannot help. Uh, I mean, our resources are limited, no matter at which scale operation you run. Definitely. Uh, kind of looking at all of the people that need help and trying to prioritize that is one of the one of the most difficult, probably the most difficult uh decision to make uh but it definitely kind of shows uh, that of course is that people who already show some motivation some will to to kind of uh, who act despite the circumstances supporting them uh makes it much more impactful because uh we had many interactions uh and it was quite one of the kind of one of the most difficult things to uh to communicate about Toloka in that way is that Toloka is not a Santa Claus. Uh, we're not there to just kind of go around and give everybody equipment and tools and gift all of this beautiful technology. We just don't have resources for that. Occasionally we had a little bit, but those are very limited and we don't we don't have kind of an infinite supply of this. Uh but kind of choosing where and how to deploy this is the difficult question. So, and in this sense, uh, it is kind of when the conversation goes about, well, if and when kind of you would give us these tools, then we would do that and that and that. And there's a person kind of an organization next to it saying kind of, well, despite the fact that we tried it three years ago and then two years ago, and we still didn't get it, but we're already doing that and that. And then it's a clear, clear cut decision, uh, kind of that, uh, uh, whom to support with this, with these tools, uh, probably 
other organizations, other people need very different kind of support, uh, but kind of understanding where and how, uh, what you can offer, what you can provide, uh, can actually gain a momentum of, of its own. That is that is the most that is the most important thing. Thank you very much. Well, Constantin, thank you so much. I also have some still questions in my mind, though we had so many conversations with you before too, but uh, still when this project of Tolokar, you know, just uh, starting a kind of a, a initiative in the format of a project in your case that uh, aims at uh, supporting the people, especially in this war situation. Well, uh, kind of starting that, uh, you know, huge uh, energy of cooperation and do it together culture. This is the, I think, the most basic part of it, you know, uh, because uh, and uh, sometimes it uh, feels like it's not something uh, uh, easy to do as an outsider, I will say, you know, uh, because in our case in Turkey, uh, I don't know how it uh, kind of developed in your case, but uh, for the disaster uh, district and zone, when you try to start something just with the very good intentions of, of course, supporting those people or, you know, providing some kind of a know-how for making their lives kind of better, easier, or whatever we may name it, Mm -hmm. um, the, the the first moment of you know just starting that communication and starting that culture of cooperation uh, is is uh, not that easy or I would like to in fact. I'm not tired. Not that I'm not tired. Just the fact that I like that all the things that we not. And I would like to learn from your side. You know that because it can cause something uh, really very. You know, the feelings of skepticism, you know, people can be skeptic about me because you are coming somewhere, you know, you are, in our case, we are not, we are not the insiders of that, uh, let's say, disaster situation, we are, you know, coming from somewhere else, saying that uh, we would like to provide some support and everything. So, uh, however, all these projects, especially that Tolokar project, yeah, besides being a fab lab, trying to bring a certain technology or technological mindset to ease things and make things faster. Besides that, you know, just developing that culture of cooperation, you know, as different parts of a certain community. Well, how that works uh, on your side is, is a kind of a question I have uh, in my mind. You know, uh, I, though I found it very, very valuable. And when I see your photos, there's always crowds of people just uh, really uh, including the local people, local, I don't know, resources. At the end of your talk, you said that there's no problem of funding at the moment. There are so many people who are donating. So how that really uh, develops itself into such a kind of a both inclusive, cooperative, and less really working together and doing together culture. How, how, how uh, that really progress into that is, yes, know, so, I would so, like to hear. Yeah, so the word Toloka itself is uh, kind of national Ukrainian form of uh, solidarity and help. Uh, it is an ancient practice when uh, uh, in a village somebody needs their roof renovated. And then one year the whole village gets together and renovates the roof on one house. Uh, or somebody needs to have their kind of uh, field, uh, their, their crops collected. And that, that already is part of Ukrainian culture, and there's a word for that called toloka. It's a little bit like the word itself means just kind of pushing around, like people who just kind of rumble around. Tolochsa means it's like, uh, yeah. And uh, uh, one actually, one of the most uh, interesting uh, initiatives, apart from toloka, that, uh, that started happening in Ukraine early on, uh, there is a group of uh, Kiev clubbers and ravers, uh, and uh, what they did, they took their DJ equipment to uh, demolished uh, houses in Chernihiv. Uh, they set up the stage, put up big speakers, and were blasting techno, and brought all of their all of their crowds. But then instead of clubbing at night, they would be cleaning bricks and kind of 
uh, removing all of this all this garbage, and then that's actually uh, uh, there was yeah. So they they turned it into this kind of repair Toloka raves uh, where they would channel all of that energy of these people through music, uh, but just kind of that that same community which had uh, was never aimed aimed at this, uh, but uh, kind of in this form of uh, Solidarity and willingness to willingness to help and cooperate. Uh, so, uh, not to say that this is. Uh, I mean, yeah, I guess Ukraine is lucky in this sense with uh, with kind of having that that form of solidarity. You don't come across it everywhere you go. Uh, I mean, not not to say that this is kind of such a common general thing. But it helps uh, kind of having some of those examples to communicate this, these things and to kind of maintain this spirit. Uh, but what definitely uh, uh, is necessary every time to kind of to engage closer with the, with the community, you just need to stay there. Uh, you find one little entry point, uh, you find one little house uh, that is demolished and one person who is collaborative and who is interested uh, and then you go and start working on that one little house. Uh, but while you stay there, that person, uh, there's neighbors coming to ask what is happening here. Uh, you kind of, you gain their trust uh, slowly. Yes, a lot of people, even who are in desperate need of help, they don't ask for that help. Uh, they, they're skeptical of the help. And actually, that's what we learned through working with the windows is that uh, even though we had that city council list of kind of couple hundred houses, the ones who actually needed our windows were never on this list. Those were the people who were visiting, and then we had those conversations like, do you know somebody? Well, it, the solution maybe is not right for you, but you know somebody who needs it. And then they would be pointing us. There was one woman who was working as a postwoman, and she had three kids at home continuously, but she had no time to just even go and fill in any of these forms to register that she needed like this. Then there was another woman that uh, uh, she uh, she worked as a kind of construction worker most of her life, so she felt pretty kind of uh, confident and self-sufficient. And she's like, well, there's many more other people who need this solution, who need help than I do. And then she would kind of cuddle up her, make her own little, little tiny room and keep it warm. And the rest of the house was demolished. Uh, and then she's like, well, I will just stay there because there's other people who need that help more than I do. Uh, and it took, that's, that, that was our work to just kind of go there and have these conversations with these people and spend time with them. And sometimes there would be, you would meet a person uh, that, uh, that all they wanted, actually, all they needed was like a, couple cans of this spray foam or this polyurethane foam that's all they needed in terms of materials but they need at least like half an hour to tell you about their story to tell you about the horrors they went through they need somebody to share they need to see that somebody listens and they need uh, uh, to feel that they can trust somebody uh, and that's that's ultimately kind of it's a very i mean if most of, say, how you operate Toloka and how you operate laser cutters and design CAD, uh, uh, CAD files for 3D printing, you can learn all of that on YouTube. This kind of stuff you can't. Uh, these soft skills, this uh, way to listen to these people. That's actually, in the beginning, again, some of our team was quite frustrated that we come to these places and there are these people who just, they don't let you go. They, you, you kind of, if you come there, you see, well, this solution doesn't fit here, but people just stay there and they talk and they talk. Uh, and you have to listen, you have to stay there and you have to actually engage it. So, because some of my colleagues were like, well, how long can you listen to this thing? We need to go. Uh, like, no, this is, this is not the attitude. But gradually, everybody on the team uh, kind of grew and appreciated and learned that. Uh, it is, it is not about the things. It is not about, I mean, things become, yes, they're helpful. Yes, they can change, uh, can have a big impact. But only after kind of they fit into the story, only after you've understood what this thing is for and who needs it and why people need it uh, and who are these people. Uh, so uh, it is, uh, things are important, but ultimately, uh, if there were, 
no stories and no propaganda, this war wouldn't be happening uh, neither. So it is it is much more about what you tell with this with this stuff and how you communicate with all these people. Uh, and uh, the people going through such suffering, first thing and foremost, they need somebody to trust again. Uh, they need somebody to, if you come and promise them kind of most beautiful things, there's probably a lot of people showing up there trying to fix it and uh, not everybody is delivering what they expected. So people get get skeptical or they suffered so much loss and pain that they don't care about their house anymore. Uh, why kind of they, uh, if they have lost the whole of their family, kind of why would they even be trying to renovate the house? Uh, I, it's, it's unimaginable to think what this, what these people are, but it's, it's essential to just kind of have all of this confronting, painful conversations with them. So are there any educations for volunteers or people working in your project, you know, just how to start the conversation, how to, do you have uh, such pedagogical educations or something? We, we, we did, we didn't get to, we didn't get to that. Uh, I mean, as, uh, uh, as much of learning happens, uh, in our team is just kind of, you, you, you jump in and you swim, uh, I mean, what helps in our case, uh, actually, are these very long road trips. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and that is that is very helpful, where we just kind of, uh, we are almost forced to sit down as a team in one car for like five, six, ten hours, and we talk about this stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and That's that true. that helps a lot. Yeah. Questions? Anyone? Well, I think if there's no more questions, then maybe we can end it here. Uh, again, I, I really would like to thank you on behalf of everyone in here uh, for accepting our invitation and for sharing your experiences and knowledge with us. It was very uh, informative and helpful. Uh, hopefully, uh, we can build something later on in the future that can help everyone. I mean, I know that it's a quite optimistic way of looking at things, but I'd like to see it this way, at least. Again, thank you very much. Nice having you uh, in our Mechanical Nishmalara. Thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure. Thank you for inviting. Thank you. Thank you so much, Constantin.